My name is uh, Sushil Kadali. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Columbia University in New York. Uh, so the Trizen study is looking at studying the uh, sort of the F safety and feasibility of uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement with the Evoke uh, system. Uh, and, and part of the rationale is, uh, I think over the last several years and the last decade, we've seen that severe TR uh, it, and, and transcatheter options for the treatment of severe TR is an unmet need. We're seeing more and more patients that present with symptomatic TR that are not good surgical candidates that don't have options. And even the guidelines uh, don't really address the issue of options for treatment of tricuspid regurgitation. And, you know, guideline directed medical therapy is management of left-sided heart disease and diuretics. So it, there's a lot of patients with symptoms and, you know, there are different devices that are looking at it, you know, transcatheter repair technologies with either Triluminate and Pascal have done some early feasibility studies showing that it's, it's feasible, but they also demonstrated a lot of the limitations of repair. You know, there are a lot of anatomies that aren't suitable. You, you can't get in a, a, you know, get, getting predictable uh, reduction of TR to moderate or less is, is not always feasible in many patients. And so transcatheter replacement uh, from a femoral approach uh, in, a, in a manner similar to TAVR would potentially be an ideal option. And the Evoke system from Edwards is designed to replace the tricuspid valve in a native tricuspid annulus via a transfemoral percutaneous uh, approach. So this was a, a prospective uh, single arm multi-center study. Um, you know, it, it, there was a fair amount of trial oversight. There was a central screening committee uh, made up of uh, people from the uh, from the company, but also physician uh, leaders, an echocardiographic core lab, a clinical events committee, and a data safety monitoring board. The population was basically patients with symptomatic moderate or greater TR. Uh, although the majority, more than 90%, had severe and, you know, and 50% and had massive or torrential TR. These were patients that were seen by their local heart team and felt to have symptoms despite optimal medical therapy. And so then they underwent screening with a TEE and a CTA. And if they were anatomically suitable, they uh, were eligible to receive the Evoke valve replacement system. The, the endpoints were device and procedural success. Um, you know, device success was the valve deployed and the delivery system retrieved in the in intended position. Um, and uh, the procedural success um, was basically device success without significant PVL um, at the end of the uh, at the end of the by discharge. And then the other endpoint was major adverse events at 30 days. So we've, uh, the key findings basically in an elderly population with a mean age of 79 that was sort of high risk for surgery with a lot of comorbidities, including AFib in more than 90%, ascites in more than 20%, uh, chronic kidney disease in, in two thirds of the patients, and you know, patients uh, who had uh, prior surgery in, in prior cabbage in, in 14%, prior valve surgery in 40%, that the transfemoral replacement uh, was feasible. Um, you know, the, the valve was deployed in, in all but one patient successfully. Um, procedural success was 94%. Um, we, and, the, and this was done in, in, in a uh, percutaneous manner in all patients. Um, the, you know, these were patients that had a median length of stay post-procedure of three days. And the vast majority, 89%, were discharged at home. Another 5% were discharged home with services, and only 5% were discharged to a nursing facility um, or, or, or another, another hospital. Um, and so it was, it was a feasible approach in this elderly, highly comorbid population. Now, there were uh, you know, adverse events, uh, which, is, which is not uh, unexpected. Um, the uh, the uh, major adverse event rates uh, was 22.6%. Uh, um, the majority of these were bleeding events as defined by MVAR criteria. Um, and the and none of the bleeding events were life-threatening or, or fatal. 
Um, the the and, and many of them were not related to the procedure. There was one vascular site uh, or access site bleeding. There, there was four vascular bleedings, sort of non-access site, but the rest were not related to the evoke valve replacement procedure. There were some epistaxis, there were two GI bleeds, there was hematuria. There were two patients that uh, had blood loss during uh, follow-up surgical tricuspid valve intervention. But there, they, you know, in this elderly population uh, with high bleeding risk, and as I said, 20% ascites, um, the bleeding rates were not surprising. There was one cardiovascular mortality. Uh, this was a patient uh, that had a evoked procedure that was where the valve was deployed low. They required a sapient in it. And the patient just sort of had persistent right heart failure after and died at, at around three weeks. Um, there was one uh, other mortality, which was not cardiovascular. A patient died from uh, carcinoid that was a pre-existing uh, within 30 days. As I said, there were two patients that ended up having surgical re-intervention, and this was for you know, valve embolization or valve migration or valve malpositioning. Um, and so uh, these two patients went to surgery, uh, got their valve uh, explanted, and, uh, um, and then uh, they were um, uh, discharged successfully. Um, so the, the other important finding is that the device worked well in reducing TR. Um, when we look at uh, matched echoes, uh, as I said, 44% had massive or torrential TR at baseline. At 30-day follow-up, um, the, the all but one patient had mild or none TR. Two-thirds of patients had none or trace TR. So the valve was effective. Um, and one, and there was also evidence of, uh, you know, sort of uh, remodeling post-valve replacement. RV mid-diastolic diameters and IVC diameters um, got smaller between baseline and 30 days. One uh, important concern that we all have with transcatheter replacement is how does the RV handle it and how does RV function work? Um, and th th what we noticed was uh, after the procedure uh, at discharge, there was some worsening of RV function. Um, you know, patients with severe RV dysfunction were e excluded from the trial. Uh, but at discharge, there was some worsening at RV function with, you know, about a quarter of the patients have, having moderate or severe RV dysfunction. Um, but we noticed by 30 days that this had started to improve. Um, and so there, that, that's something that we need to look at more closely as we go forward. Importantly, these patients got tremendous clinical benefit. Um, there was a, about a significant improvement in six-minute walk distance by about 46 meters from a very, you know, sort of inhibited baseline of around 200 meters. Uh, they improved significantly. KCCQ scores improved by 19 points, which is dramatic. And this is the same level of improvement that we've seen with uh, uh, other transcatheter valve therapies, such as MitroClip or TAVR. So these patients do benefit and, and fixing TR does help these patients clinically as well. So, I mean, I think the conclusions are that, it, you know, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement is feasible. Um, it, it, it is effective at reducing TR. There's clinical benefit. You know, the, the device um, uh, is, it can be done in the vast majority of patients uh, safely. Um, the, and, you know, sort of based on these results, uh, we, we've started the randomized pivotal trial, TRISEN2, to really demonstrate that, that in this population of high-risk patients with TR, that treatment does uh, improve both clinical and uh, other long-term outcomes.